You're listening to Just Neighbors, where we are learning to practice biblical justice and compassion together. Welcome back to Just Neighbors. We are so happy to have you. I can't wait for today's episode. And Ryan, why don't you tell us what we're in for? Oh, yeah. We're in for a real treat, to use a bit of a pun. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Tree has his PhD from Wheaton College. He's the pastor for preaching and vision at Reality LA, one of my favorite churches in the Los Angeles area. And he's the author of a handful of books, including Seek First, How the Kingdom of God Changes Everything, The Crucified King, Atonement, and Kingdom in Biblical and Systematic Theology, and The Atonement, An Introduction. And if that weren't enough, I hear you even <laughs> delivered your second child in a car because you what? didn't get to the hospital in time. Is this correct? This is the truth. It's a long story, but yeah, front seat of the car in oh, the streets of Chicago. Goodness. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Delivering three books is one thing, but delivering <laughs> your own daughter into the world is amazing. Wow. Well, um, yeah, we have Jeremy on because I've just uh, I've watched his ministry from afar and, and gotten to meet him before. And I just have such respect for you and your team, the way that you guys are so true to the gospel, but so clear on our responsibility to engage justice and mercy for the city. And so it's just a joy to have you on. Well, thank you both. I'm, I'm grateful for what you guys are doing and glad to be here with you. Oh, great. Yeah. So let's start by, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, Reality LA's work in Los Angeles, specifically with the Hope Center. Sure. Well, I mean, about me, I, I grew up in Alaska and then lived in Seattle a good portion of my life mm. and I've uh, been in Los Angeles for 11 years now. Wow. And my wife and I have four daughters, uh, two, in, two in elementary and two in middle school. And we just love it here. We're so glad that that God called us here and that we get to be a part of the work that he's done mm. and is doing in and through the church. And yeah, Reality LA started in 2006 and I didn't plant the church. My good friend, Tim Chaddock did. I came in 2013 and our vision is to seek the renewal of Los Angeles through the good news of Jesus. Yep. And we really believe that God can take what's broken and make it new by grace. And we've experienced that renewal and we want to see it spread throughout the city. And, but we believe that that gospel renewal is a holistic renewal. And so we want to see the lost saved yes. and the lonely brought into family and uh, the, the city of angels become more like the city of God. Mm -hmm. And so Amen. that's what we've been seeking for the last 18 years. And, uh, but four years ago, we had a, a, a really, um, trajectory altering thing happened in our church where another church in East Hollywood approached us and they, they were a small church and their congregation joined our church. And we inherited uh, these two buildings and these incredible ministries that they had developed over the years. And so we have a, a small church building in East Hollywood that we call the hope center. And we, we still meet in a, we do our morning service in a high school down the street on sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do an evening service at the Hope Center. But more important than the buildings was we inherited these ministries. Mm -hmm. And as a church, we'd been seeking gospel renewal. But honestly, it was really hard to find tangible ways to serve the city. Mm -hmm. And what we inherited was a food ministry where we serve a thousand meals a week um, wow. to the poor and homeless in East Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And then a recovery ministry mm -hmm. of helping people get off of um drugs and get right with the Lord and get job skills and mm. uh, get back plugged into society. And so mm. that's been a real game changer for us as a church, not only in having a, having a, a, a way to serve the city in such a tangible way, but in the way that it's impacted us mm. in learning yes. um, how to see uh, dignity in all people, how to care for people who are in a tough season of life, um, and how to come alongside them without doing so in a way that sets us up as the Messiah, where we can just put ourselves yep. on the back and say, look yep. what we're doing for people who are struggling. Um, but to really recognize our mutual brokenness and yes. say, let's look to Christ together. So that's been really powerful for us as 
a church. And I just love, I love to say we preach the word and feed the hungry. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you don't have to choose between those things. Yep. Yeah. Well, word and deed. Doesn't the Bible say something about that? One thing that you've spent a lot of your time studying and thinking is the theology of atonement. And one of the uh, reasons we wanted to have you on was just number one, why don't you just kind of explain what is the theology of atonement? And it's not always uh, a conversation about the poor and how we serve those who um, are in need of the love of Christ or hungry, as you put it. So how, why were you drawn to study atonement in the first place? Why has that been such a, mm. um, a strong part of your ministry and your writing? And then how do you see that informing your work in the Hope Center and beyond? Yeah. So, I mean, the atonement, I know that that's a big theological word, but it just means at one meant. Mm. So it's, it's the idea of how Christ reconciles us to God, how he makes us Mm. at one with God when sin has separated us from Mm. God. And so the doctrine of atonement is seeking to understand what Christ accomplished on the cross and how that deals with our sin and reconciles us with our creator. And so I think for me personally, I just, I mean, my life was transformed through the cross and wanting to understand the depths of it. And part of the reason I wrote this book, I I mean, two things come to mind. One is that I found that a lot of people are chasing after and spending time focusing on whatever the latest controversial issue is Hmm. and a lot of social issues and they're, and those are really important and they're going after those things, but without much of a foundation theologically. Mm. So we get excited about the latest social debate, but we kind of yawn over the doctrine of atonement. Mm. And I'm like, this is the climax of human history. Yeah. There's nothing better than this. Mm-hmm. And not only is it so important in and of itself, but then it informs all of these issues, whether we're talking about race or gender or justice. And so in the book, I try to unpack the meaning of the atonement, but then I also try to connect it to things that that we're seeing in our lives, discipleship, politics, racism, community. And so I think that that's not just applying the atonement. I think it's it's part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Part of this, I think one of the reasons people have a hard time connecting atonement with daily life is they only think about the vertical dimension. Mm -hmm. So the Christ atoning work on the cross reconciles me to God. But what we learn in Ephesians 2 and in lots of other places in scripture is that Christ's work on the cross also tears down the dividing wall of hostility Mm -hmm. and reconciles us with one another in, in a way that has all kinds of cultural implications about ethnicity and gender and all of that. And so I think we've got to recognize how the cross then creates a cross shaped people Hmm. and that transforms our posture and how we engage with the world. So, I mean, that's just kind of a little overview. Let me share two ways in particular that I think atonement helps inform justice work. Mm, Yes. Um, One is that, I mean, let's just think about justice. All right. Because when we talk about justice, a lot of people, they want to start with, me and my passion, right? And whatever kind of issue they want to champion. We almost act like justice is our idea mm-hmm. and that we need yeah. to like get God's blessing on it, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, let me tell you about a God of justice. Mm, yeah. Before you were ever born, before you ever got passionate about whatever justice issue you're championing, there has been a God of perfect justice. Mm, and so we start so with, a, with a God of justice and then... God justifies his people Mm -hmm. and he does that through the cross. And so he, he makes us right with him. He declares us righteous Mm -hmm. and it's not by any works of our own, but by what God has done for us through the death of Christ on the cross. He died Mm -hmm. in our place for our sins and we receive his righteousness. That's substitutionary atonement. And so you have a just God who justifies his people And then calls us into his work of seeking justice in the world. And and it's it's really important that what I said there of it's his work of justice. Mm. 
-hmm. It's not like Jesus died on the cross. He's like, all right, I passed the baton to you. I saved your sins. Now you guys go fix the world, right? (laughs) Um, No, like God is on a mission of justice and he has brought us into that. So we get to take part in his work of justice. Um, and you see this throughout the scriptures. I mean, one example I love is in, I think it's Deuteronomy 10, where it talks about God cares for the orphan and the immigrant. And then he says, and now you go care for the orphan and the immigrant, mm-hmm. right? So it's like, it's God's agenda. It's God's mission. And yet he does that. He accomplishes those things through his people. Mm-hmm. So justice is, is so core to what we believe in general but then it's at the heart of the gospel mm-hmm. and it plays out in the Christian life. Jeremy, I, I love that framework and that um, refrain that justice is his idea. We join God in his mm-hmm. work. I remember there's a community development organization uh, where I live and uh, I was leading a discipleship house of about six guys and we lived intentionally in this neighborhood. We partnered with this organization and we showed up for like a day of introduction of what they do. And um, the leader, the founder of this organization, you know, met with us and he's like, okay, I want you to walk through the neighborhood and I want you to take note of everything that's broken. Take your time, 20 minutes, pray, notice what's broken and come back. And we have a whiteboard and it was like this long list. And there was a second whiteboard and it was blank. He's like, okay, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to notice everything that's beautiful. Everything that is culturally attractive. Every moment of compassion or kindness or relationship. And we came back and we looked at these whiteboards and they were both full. And he said, you'll never be able to address the first whiteboard if you don't believe in the second one. And that for me was just this total paradigm shift of approaching justice in the ways that you're talking about. God's at work in this community. God's already got things planned up and there's beauty here to be seen, not just problems to be fixed. How do we know when we are approaching God from that first whiteboard only, how do we know when we're coming at it, when we are the ones that are defining justice and what's that transition back to see God as the author of justice like? Yeah, man. I mean, I just love that. That's such a great exercise. I was taking some notes cause I think I went, <laughs> um, but I, I think it's when we draw a line down the middle and say, here are the people who have needs and who are broken. Yes. And then here are the people who have it all together and have answers. Yeah. Yeah. And we're on the side of we've got it all together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we need to go and help these people who are broken. Mm-hmm. When you have that mindset, you're setting yourself up as a Messiah. Mm-hmm. You're you're not serving people. You're using them wow. to feel good about yourself. Jeez, come on. And we need to be able to recognize that for what it is and repent of it. But the repentance begins by acknowledging the mutual brokenness. Yes. So, and maybe I I could put it this way. We need to see our own brokenness and we need to see their dignity, Mm -hmm. right? Because what we've done is we've elevated ourselves and we've pushed other people down and we need to recognize we're both made in the image of God and therefore have inherent dignity. Mm -hmm. And yet we're both broken. Yeah. And their brokenness looks different than mine, right? Mm -hmm. Like mine's more internal and it doesn't affect my finances in such a way that where I'm sleeping on the street, for example, Mm -hmm. but I'm still broken. I'm still hurting. I mean, one of the things that um, we love with when when we serve meals to the community is I always tell people it's one thing to serve someone a meal. It's another thing to sit down and share a meal with them. Yep. Yep, that's good. Because if if you're serving someone a meal, it can reinforce the kind of mm-hmm. I'm the answer, you're the problem, mm-hmm. right? But when you sit down and share a meal with somebody, it's like I need food just as much as they do. Mm-hmm. Like I need to eat today just as much as they do. And yep. they've got a story and I've got a story and when we're sitting at a table together, we're two humans made in the image of God who are hurting in different ways and who have yeah. hopes and dreams and all of that. And so I love that to be able to sit down and say, Hey, tell me your story, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that like mutual brokenness and mutual dignity mm-hmm. is what we need to see to get to that place. Yeah. 
That makes me think of the time when our, we had three kids in foster care. Or we were foster parenting three kids, and we knew their parents, and we're trying to build a relationship with their parents. And one of the things that when I was young, my grandpa would always take us out for dinner on our birthday, and he would just treat us like, you know, royalty. And so I had talked to Clint, my husband, and said, why don't we, why don't we invite them out for dinner? And I just remember calling uh, their mom and saying, um, we'd love to take you out for dinner. And she was like, what? But being able to share stories about their kids and encourage them on. And um, it was like it did. It brought that dignity of like, we're not here, Clint and Jamie, the ones who are taking care of your kids because you've been the problem. No, we're just like two parent, two sets of parents sitting across the table with mutual love for, for the kids. And it was just this beautiful yeah, I think that's of what you're talking about. Yeah. As you're talking, just I'm starting to see the pieces so clearly put together. That's part of why we need to start with atonement, because the cross gives us a picture of what we deserve, what our sin deserves. Yes. And yes. so that's our lowly place as in need of rescue. And um, once you start from that framework, then you have a peer to peer relationship. And I think we can err on the other side, too, of um, glorifying in poverty um, and realizing, no, I'm, I may have economic resources that God is calling me to share. But that mm -hmm. doesn't mean I, my station is above those who I serve. And I love how you mm -hmm. said that so clearly, Jeremy, that we are equal in our neediness, in our desires, our hopes and our experiences and maybe the faith of someone who's had to overcome so many obstacles is something that I need to see mm -hmm. the perseverance and to see the determination and to see someone who has hope after 30 years of just chronic pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's going to minister to me as I give and bring the physical things that I have. And now we're in this relationship. And I love that invitation to sit with people as you offer food. Mm -hmm. Um I'm I'm just hearing you talk and talking about your church, and I'm just wondering, I, I think there's a school of theology that the atonement actually breeds passivity. Well, I'm justified by grace. Where do you think that breakdown is, and how do we overcome that? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways, one theologically and one historically. Mm. Theologically, I, I, I get it because if you hammer justification by faith through grace— in Christ alone, then you're emphasizing so much that we are saved not by our own works. It's mm -hmm. by what God has done for us. And so people take that and, and they lead that to, so our works don't matter, mm. right? Yeah. Or we don't need to work hard or we don't need to do anything because God's done it all. And so it's a half truth, right? Because we, we don't contribute anything to our own salvation. We are completely saved by what God has done for us in Christ. Yep. But in scripture, that doesn't lead then to we don't need to do anything or our works don't matter. The key idea is that we don't work for grace, but we do work from grace. Mm -hmm. Right? Good. So Love that. Philippians 2, like work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And, and this idea that because I've been saved, now I actually have this gospel motivation to join in what in the work that the Lord is doing. So grace, a, a, a real understanding of grace and being gripped by grace compels us towards love. Mm, yes. So yep. it's not that, hey, you're a Christian, you have to do these things because the Bible says them, hmm. right? It's, it's no, God has redeemed my heart and I've received of his love and that calls me into his work of love. Yeah. And, and so I see the needs around me. Mm -hmm. I want to use the resources that I have to help other people. How could I not? I had nothing and God came to me with everything, right? Yep. So I think there's a misunderstanding of grace and we need to move towards a, a, an understanding of like a grace-driven effort and working from grace. Yeah. The other reason why I think that that we end up in a situation today where you you have churches that either preach the Bible or feed the hungry mm -hmm. is because how things have developed over time historically. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to the 1930s, you had this movement in New York that became known as the social gospel movement. Mm -hmm. And what you see is you have churches there who, while they're being influenced by 
German liberal theology and starting to question things like the resurrection of Jesus, mm. for example, because we don't know if modern people can believe in such a thing. Mm. While they're doing that, they're also recognizing they're surrounded by poverty and brokenness mm. and, and, and compelled by the love of God to help people. Mm. And so they're going and they're serving the poor and they're helping the broken. And yet what happened in that social gospel movement is they redefined the gospel itself. The gospel is not about sin and salvation and what God has done for you. The gospel is about what we do to make the world a better place. Mm. And so that's, that's the problem there is that they lost the gospel in seeking to serve the poor. Mm. And so what you had then is you had conservative Christians who reacted against that. Yeah. And I would say who swung the pendulum all the way to the other side mm. and said, oh, well, the liberals are serving the poor and they don't believe in substitutionary atonement or the bodily resurrection of Jesus or the inerrancy of scripture. And so we're going to be a Bible preaching church, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you get this pendulum swinging reductionism that leads to we're Bible preaching churches. We're churches that care about justice and the poor. Mm -hmm. And you open your Bible and you're like, why is there this dichotomy, yeah. right? Like this, we're called to, proclaim the gospel of the kingdom and go out and then demonstrate what that looks like in day-to-day -day life. And so it breaks my heart that mm -hmm. it does feel like you have word churches and deed churches. Yeah. And for the record, I don't think that every church needs to have a ministry that's serving meals to the poor. Mm -hmm. That's something that God entrusted us and is a particular ministry that we have. But I do think that every church has an obligation towards word and deed. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I do think every church has an obligation um, towards proclamation of the gospel and seeking justice in the, in the place where the Lord has called them. Hey neighbors, it's Jamie. I want to tell you about a resource our team over at the Forgotten Initiative has created. If you're looking for a way to encourage your church to step into the ministry of mercy through foster care, but you aren't quite sure where to start the conversation, check out TFI's four-part video series, Foster Care and the Church. You don't have to become a foster parent to step into loving those in the foster care community. Foster Care and the Church sets the foundation for conversations about what it might look like to love your neighbors in need. We'll explore why foster care exists biblically, how the gospel intersects with foster care, and give you next steps. Here's what one pastor is saying about foster care and the church. TFI's foster care and the church resources are powerful tools for the local church. With accessible, respectful language and concrete examples, they articulate the needs present in foster care clearly. And they provide a framework for helping churches develop a vision for caring for the foster care community that is grounded in scripture and the heart of Jesus. The content is a powerful encouragement that the church can and should advocate for greater awareness of and ministry to the foster care community. We'd love to help you engage your community as you think deeply about what it looks like to practice being a just neighbor. Head over to fostercare.church to gain access to our free four-part video series and full kit complete with a participant guide featuring discussion questions, prayer prompts, and promotional material. You've had your theology professor hat on for a while now, and you've served <laughs> us so well, but um, I think we'll ask you to take that hat off and put on your pastoral hat, although you can't fully separate those things as you're well aware of. And um, I just, you know, I think back to my own story and my own journey um, of engaging in uh, people who are suffering um, and, you know, the call to become a, a foster parent, which I've been now for the last seven years. And there's just a lot of apathy that I've had towards people mm -hmm. suffering throughout the years. It's it, it there comes a point where it's kind of hard to care, especially when you live in a place that's urban like Los, Los Angeles. And there's suffering and loneliness and pain all around us. But mm. it's it's clearly on display in our urban areas. And maybe just talk to us pastorally. What do we do with our own apathy? You know, maybe we intellectually ascribe to God was compassionate to me. Therefore, I'm invited to be compassionate towards others. But we just find ourselves, if we actually look at our schedule, if we look at how we spend our time and our finances, we're not 
living proximity with the poor. We're not spending our money to help those who are suffering. What do we do with our own apathy and how do we kind of uh, just grow through that? Yeah. Well, I think part of this is that we have to acknowledge that there's so much injustice in the world mm, yeah. and we have access to hearing about it through social media all the time now that it's far too much for anyone to handle. Right. Mm, yeah. And and what happens is there's just a numbness that sets in mm -hmm. that I can't genuinely empathize mm. with every tragedy that I hear of. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the ways that I've experienced this in LA is that there are so many people in this city who are experiencing homelessness mm. that they just become invisible. Mm. You just start to think those are homeless people and write them off. Mm. And you, you literally just start to ignore them. You walk yeah. by, you don't even notice. And so I think, I think one thing that we need to do is just recognize that how that's happening. Right. Mm -hmm. And at, at one level to recognize that it's, it's okay to not be able to feel empathy about every everything that's going yep. on around us. yeah that's right. really good it's like oh my goodness i haven't checked in on the ukraine war in like two weeks and i feel bad that i haven't been mm -hmm. praying for them but oh no then i heard about this thing that just happened you know in west hollywood and i've got to like and then there's stuff in my own family and right. like we just only have so much capacity yeah and so some of that honestly is i think we probably need to be careful with our intake mm. of like how that's much good. Yeah. How much we're taking in. Like if you've got the news on all day, like you're just going to become numb. If you're, mm -hmm. if you're on social media all day, you're not going to be able to care about anything mm -hmm. because you've spread yourself so thin. So yeah. at one level, I think we just have to acknowledge like our, our digital culture and what that's doing to us. Mm -hmm. the, the, then I would say, try to think about this stuff as not so much about issues, but as about people. Yeah. Right. So like I, I always talk about this with immigration with people for a lot of people, immigration is just an issue. Mm. It's just a social issue. Mm -hmm. And they've got their talking points that they hear on CNN or Fox news. Mm -hmm. And one of the gifts of living in LA is for, for me, like immigration is not just an issue. Like I, I, I can tell you the names of people. Yeah. who are directly affected by whatever policies are happening or how we talk about the stories of how they came across the border, you know, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I would say when we think about kind of the overwhelming weight of the brokenness of the world, don't think about the issues, think of people mm -hmm. and yeah. what people are there in your life yeah. that you can start to pray for and that you yeah. can start to invest in. And that you can say, I need to learn how to understand what that person is going through right now. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what it's like to grow up in the foster care system. And I want to try and learn a little bit so that I can empathize with this person who did um, so that, yeah, so that I can show the love of God to them. So I, I would say, like, be aware of what our digital culture is doing and then look to people before issues. And then the last thing I would say is, like, look look at God's heart. I just think that the more we see God's passion for the broken, for the disenfranchised, for the marginalized, the, the more it's going to um, light a flame in us mm. to, to say, if, if God is passionate about something, then indifference is not an option for us. Wow. And yeah. throughout the scriptures, you just see over and over again, God's heart for the poor, God's heart for the marginalized. And so I think as we look to God more and more and not just our favorite verses, but like mm -hmm. reading the Bible, under seeing all of who God is, I think that's going to stir us mm -hmm. um, to, to, to reflect God's heart for people. Yeah. So good. I resonate so much with that um, at the Forgotten Initiative often, you know, if, if I'm doing a podcast or just talking to someone and they say, tell me more about the foster care system or tell me what's going on. What are the trends of foster care? I will usually say, actually, can I just tell you about the people of foster care? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can yeah. I tell you about the birth, the, the, the mom who's lost her kids in care? Can I tell you about the child who is 
feeling like they are just bouncing from place to place, right? Um, because that's what grabs our heart, like you're saying, and that's what helps us identify as humans to each other. Um, mm -hmm. One thing we say often is awareness leads to action. And yet awareness alone of like facts and figures or issues isn't going to move us to that compassion and understanding, right? It's, mm -hmm. It might move us. Like when you look on Instagram and you're trying to wear the weight of the world on your shoulders by everything, you start to feel this guilt, like I don't care enough. And so you start to want to move to action out of this guilt or compelled by people as opposed to compelled by like the love of God. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that that translates into almost any kind of issue yeah. that you can talk about, you know, yeah. uh, whether right. it's sexuality or gender or race, mm -hmm. like any of this stuff is it's important that we talk about it at a societal level and policies sure, and all sure. of that stuff, but to actually sit down and hear people's experiences right. transforms the way that you think about it yeah. completely. And so I, I think that we, we have to have that approach. I mean, I was just talking about this with, with gender and like, I, I have lots of theological beliefs and positions about gender and what it means to be made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. But I, I also want to be careful in the way that I talk about those recognizing for a lot of teenagers in our society today, right. they're just hurting mm -hmm. and they're just yeah. trying to figure things out yep. and they, they, society's giving them options and they're running with those. Yep. And yep. so we need to be able to have that conversation at both levels. Like yes. policies matter, advocating for truth matters. But, but at the core of this is people who are hurting right. and crying right. out for help. Yep. And we need to have truth and grace as we approach the conversations and the people. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Jeremy, I um, would love to hear from you. I feel like the Hope Center is got so much work in for it. And um, I can just see God's hand in leading you to come to these um, conclusions and to minister to people so well. But one of our values on the Just Neighbors podcast is kind of vulnerability, moments where we blew it because we're all in process. Mm -hmm. We're all slowly moving towards Christ-likeness. And can you think of a moment either in your church or personally where you kind of fell short of being a just neighbor? Maybe you tried an outreach and it, it just kind of fell flat on its face or you were convicted about a way that you interacted with someone. How Maybe let us in a little bit on the process that God has taken you on. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean the first thing that comes to mind is for me just personally of things that I've said from the pulpit Mm. that um that were hurtful to people mm. and i the the thing that that comes to mind for me the most is learning to be aware and sensitive towards different cultural backgrounds mm. and how things come across to people and in what i'm communicating and so i'm just so grateful thinking about people in our church who have lovingly helped me see some of those blind spots mm. yeah being able to say like hey i come from a Asian American context. And here's like, here's how we've talked about this. And when you said this, like, here's how I think a lot of Asian Americans would have heard mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. We have a very diverse congregation. And so I, I, I think of those ways where, you know, obviously not intentionally in my part, but where I've said things that are insensitive or hurtful, or even just not honoring in opportunities where they could have been. So that's the first thing that comes to mind for me as a preacher. Another thing that's interesting is that, you know, I talked about the, the, the beauty of what we inherited in when we were given the church building and received these ministries. Part of, part of what we, we inherited a story though. And we talk about, mm -hmm. you know, we're at 96 years of gospel ministry that we're stewarding wow. and, and continuing that story. Yep. But we've talked about while we want to celebrate the good in that, we also have to acknowledge some of the shortcomings that we inherit as well. Mm. So like part of the story of the church was um, it was a booming church in the twenties and thirties. Um, and, and, you know, you know, different as like the film industry is developing, you have actors there and everything, but in the sixties and the seventies, you have this um, um, flood of immigrants that come into East Hollywood and, the that really changed the neighborhood 
Hmm. And so honestly, what happened in that time is you had white flight hmm. and a lot of the congregation moved out and moved hmm. out to the suburbs and moved out to um, uh, places that were just easier. And, and the church really declined with that. Hmm. And, and so that's one of the things that we've talked about is acknowledging, like, that's hmm. part of the story yeah. that we yeah. inherit. Hmm. So how can we acknowledge that? And then be able to say, what does it look like for us to really be a loving presence in our city and in this neighborhood now where we have, you know, praise God, we have young people who are coming in and serving and glad to help. But we don't want to have like a gentrification mindset of like, we're coming in and going to do these things. Um, We want to come in humbly saying the Lord's been at work here. We've inherited a story that's a part of that work, but also that has some parts that we're not proud of either. Um, So I think that keeps us humble. It keeps us honest in being able to acknowledge that and say, we've, we want to point towards the solution, but we've been a part of the problem too. And that's, that's helpful for us to always remember, like, we're not the solution. We're a part of the problem. We can tell you about the solution. His name is Jesus. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Wow. Just love your humility in that to accept that. And I just think that is, that's so, and back to atonement <laughs> once again like you're just proving your own point over and over <laughs> the importance of these books that you've written that like you get mm-hmm. that if you start with the story of god you right. get that we start as the problem not as the answer and mm-hmm. that's in our dna and we were the redeemed ones uh who then go to work with god in that journey of redemption well jeremy this has been so helpful talking about atonement and its implications for our life for justice for caring for the vulnerable just thank you so much for your insight and your passion and just your example as we close out our time i'd love to hear from you just some practical steps we can take formationally how do we make that transition from being just a neighbor just i just live on my street i just stick with my family and my friends to a just neighbor someone who really lives out mercy and compassion yeah, I mean, I'll I'll tell you one thing that I I try and teach people and train them in all the time in this area. It's so practical, and it's just learn to see dignity first. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay? And here's what I mean by that: is if you go out in front of the Hope Center and and see the crowd that's starting to gather to get ready for the meal uh, that's being prepared for later on, what most people will see when they see that group is they will see their, that they're dirty, that their clothes are tattered, that their hair is disheveled. They'll see poverty. They'll see brokenness, uh, all of that. And all of that is, is, is real. It's part of it. But what I want to teach people to do is you see dignity first. Those yeah. people fundamentally are image bearers of God, who is, yes. they are made by God and known by God and loved by God. Yeah. And what happens is if you see their dignity before their needs, then you can, you can, um, you can acknowledge their needs without defining them by their needs. Right. So it's not, it's not just a needy person who's mentally ill or who's addicted or who's been through trauma, even though all those things are true. Mm. They're an image bearer of God. Yes. Who's worthy of respect. Yep and love. And when you see dignity first, then you recognize I'm coming alongside of them rather than just looking down upon them. And that's, that's true of people who are in difficult situations. It's also true of people you disagree with, right? When you, when you're in a political debate with someone you disagree Mm -hmm. with, you see dignity first. You recognize that that's an image bearer of God that I need to treat with respect, even though I might disagree with their ideas. So I think that's, it's, it's a practical thing, day-to-day life that whoever you see, you see dignity before their needs Mm -hmm. and it will really start to shape the way that you see people and the way that you treat people. Yeah. Amen. Dignity first. That's a good word. Well, thank you so much for being on, just sharing your life and your wisdom. Would you mind just praying for us as we journey on becoming people of mercy and justice. Yeah, I would love that. Father, we praise you as a God of mercy and justice, Lord. And uh, we thank you that justice is your agenda before it was ever ours, God. 
And we thank you that though you are just, you are also gracious and loving and kind. And that you've made a way through the life, death, and resurrection of your son Jesus to deal with our sin, uh, to reconcile us to yourself and draw us into this mission of mercy and justice that uh, you are bringing throughout the world. And so, God, would you give us a humility and a passion for the work that you're doing and that you've invited us into? And, Father, I pray that we would um, that we would get this theologically, but also that we would just have the wisdom to be able to translate it to day-to-day life, to see dignity in people, um, to see people before we see issues, to be able to know where to invest our time and our energy and our passion, Lord. Um, would you just use us in the work that you're doing? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just Neighbors is a resource of the Forgotten Initiative, a Christ-centered nonprofit ministry that exists to help churches support foster care agencies across America. TFI is funded by listeners like you and other faithful ministry partners who have received value from our work and want to help us expand our efforts across the nation. We are grateful for the opportunity to serve you and your church with resources that bring understanding for the people of foster care and provide you with gospel-centered encouragement to depend on Jesus as you serve. I invite you to join us today with a gift of any amount at theforgotteninitiative.org give. Let's do this together.